Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hope you're having a good day. Uh, my name is Silburn Sidiel on The Late One. The eve of the wedding of the century, or the wedding of the week, or the wedding of the year. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Awesome. Of course, I wait for persons to come on. Every night is a good night. Every night is a fantastic night. Every night is a good night. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. And as I wait for persons to come on, um, I take this opportunity as well to look at maybe what has been in the the news today. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Good. Okay, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hi, Silburn here. Welcome, welcome to the late one. Um, tonight is going to be a, a, a special show. Well, every show is a special show. To be honest with you, every show that I put on is a special show. It is important and it is awesome and it is crucial as well as possible. You know, today has been a very interesting day. There's three big news I consider as big news. One, I just came back from a a selection for the conservative uh, parliamentary candidate to represent Lewisham um, following the MP, which is Heidi Alexander, who resigned. It is so crucial that one is able to actually to, to be a part of that process. That's why I always say get involved with the political process. You know, when uh, a parliamentary candidate or persons come on your doorstep and you wonder how and who appointed them, who selected them, there is a process. Trust me. I was with James Cleverly, who was the deputy um, chair um, for the Conservative Party as well, and I did a video. Of course, I'm not able to disclose until, um, who is the candidate until the party mentioned that tomorrow, but it's good to be a part of that process. It's exciting time. Dwayne Brooks, I understand, has joined the Conservative Party. Some will say he has left the plantation. Um, free thinkers, whatever like that, always a sellout, as people will say. Um, the lynch mob is out. <laughs> what can I say? I guess I'm used to it already. But, you know, it's a new day. It's a new dispensation. A 10-year-old, a father of a 10-year-old approached me and said, listen, my son likes politics. What can we do? I said to him, listen, I'm not going to say that he should do this like me. But what I did, I, I actually got my 6-year-old and my 10-year-old on the campaign trail they were going to different houses putting leaflets as well another mother um, i know with her seven-year-old daughter and she said guess what she wants to be the prime minister of the uk girl of jamaican ancestry that is that that is that is that is powerful ladies and gentlemen that is very powerful so what i'm trying to say is that it's a new day it's a new dispensation. It's a, it, it, it's, it's a new time where, guess what? People are actually now actually just deciding what they want to do in politics and just going for it and not actually the waiting. You know? is you know? successfully. Sorry about that. Just getting things sorted out there. You know? You know? The, the, the other thing which is in the news as well is the, the wedding which is set place to take place this weekend. That is going to be um, very interesting as well. Meghan Merkel, her dad won't be able to attend. Prince Charles might take her down the aisle. Who knows? Or she may just walk down the aisle by herself. Or her mother may walk her down the aisle. Some say who cares? But hey, she cares. 
Um, so that's going to be a big thing on Saturday as well. My, my good friend in Jamaica, um, Paul Willi- um, Roger Williams and the Willis from Ocherius, the mother passed away. They want to do a live stream of a concert tomorrow night. I may actually tap into that as well. So check that out um, for um, the Nai Nai for Miss Willie from Ocherius, those who are from Ocherius, uh, Main Street, Ocherius, Jamaica as well. So that's interesting. But tonight, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to keep the focus, keeping the focus on the whole issue of knife crime, keeping the focus on the whole issue of gun crime, keeping the whole issue of youth development at the same time, not youth on development, but youth development. You know, the news, if you recognize, do not keep the focus because the news is fickle. The news move on as a new thing displaces it. So therefore, we have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to keep the focus on key issues. And one of the focus that I'm keeping on, and I'm dedicating Thursday nights, every night, unless another night comes up based on demand, to look at knife crime and gun crime as an epidemic. So tonight I'll be having, and I'll be joined by Sandra Glenn, um, because knife crime is not only about, um, what should I say, um, the, 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 uh, it's not just about London only. But it's also about Luton. It's about Birmingham. You know, I got to understand that today that there was a, a, a killing in, in Coalfield or, 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 or so in, in Birmingham. Um, and so it, it is something which is, which, is, which is still going on. So I'll be inviting um, Sandra uh, Glenn. Um, let me see if I can get her on. Okay. I'm not seeming to get her on yet, but, you know, nevertheless, I'm sure it will happen. I always have technical itch as much as possible. So, who is Sandra Glenn? She's a community advocate and enabler who has created her own clinic to help local people with a range of issues free of charge. She has spent the last 25 years working for social good, right? She contributes to the cause of chipping away at the glass ceiling, dedicating herself to many causes aiming to create a more level playing field. Since the 90s, she has built a successful platform um, for Britain's first recruitment fair for FTSE 100 and public sector nationals to recruit graduates from black and Asian ethnicities called recruiting for the 21st century. And as well, project manage diversity conference such as London schools and the black child right so I'm going to see if I can get Carol um Sandra not Carol Sandra okay Sandra what I'm going to suggest Sandra is that you uh disconnect and reconnect for some reason I'm not getting on to you and as well as Sandra if you can do me this favor say hello so we can sign out what is happening because guess what it's an exciting time ladies and gentlemen exciting time in the uk uh, uh people are actually stepping up as much as possible sandra founded a for so good social good a vehicle to support um, our projects including diversity in social enterprise um you know luton youth opportunities network the luton windrush show um let me see if i can get back sandra Okay, okay, I think we are getting somewhere there. Sanjay is going to pop up on the screen. She's, but she's halfway. I need you long way. So you are now good. Magic. She's turning around. 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 You're one way and I'm the other, Phil Bourne. Oh. Hold on a moment. Are you around here? Get in there. Get in there. Don't worry. You get in there. You get in there. I wait till you get there. <laughs> We're gonna work. We're gonna work magic. Okay, she's gonna come back. Make sure your your video is um is horizontal, uh, Sandra, not vertical, horizontal. And then we we try it again. So yes, we we saw a snippet of Sandra there. Uh, Sandra founded for social good a vehicle to support her projects, including diversity in social enterprise. And uh, let me see if I can get her back. Uh, social enterprise. 
Bingo. Bingo. Uh, uh, Sandra Glenn, good evening to you. How are you doing today? I am fine, thank you. How are you? Awesome. I, I'm good. I'm good. I, I've been. It, it's good to be um, a part of the the political process where you can see how things happen. Right. How you get someone selected to be an MP, whichever party is Labour, Conservative, Lib Dem. How mm -hmm. you get to be a part of that process, you know? Yeah. Uh, you know, I was there in the midst a while ago getting uh, a parliamentary candidate selected for to run for Lucian. And, um, and it's going to be an interesting, um, what should I say, an interesting election. Right. But I think the most important thing for me, uh, Sandra, is that we as a people have to position ourselves strategically mm -hmm. so we can be a part of the process for the change that we want to see, isn't it? Yes, true. <laughs> To. Yeah. Uh, I have taken part in the Operation Black Vote Shadow in yes. production sessions and I yes. know that firsthand that that's a very valuable way to, to learn about being a, a, a member yes. of or even stepping up to being a councillor. I have gone through that process. I went through the one they had too for the probation office because I think we have to yes. have the black community our civic roles and our civic responsibilities Otherwise, if people aren't aware of them, they're not going to put themselves forward for election, they're not going to put themselves forward for those opportunities. And they're, they're in the background of life all the time. If you look on the websites for your local council or in the, for the court system or so on, you're going to see that there's adverts for magistrates. Look in the schools, there's adverts for governors. And of course, you can step up to become a member of parliament by approaching your, your local party and, and go yes. to, to be selected. Yeah. And, and, and just as you mentioned, Operation Black Vote with Simon Woolley, mm -hmm. uh, I did also the Shadow MP scheme, I think it was 1997. Mm -hmm. um, um, uh, at that time, I, I was with the batch with Marvin Reese, who is now the mayor of Bristol. Right. I was in the batch with Helen Grant, who is now a member of parliament for the Conservative. I was in that batch with Sanchia Alicia, who is uh, a seasoned councillor in, um, where is it, in, in Barkin. And traveling to Europe each time. So I've seen whereby it has affected people's lives and um, you see how the, the whole thing. But Sandra, why we're here tonight is, um, and ladies and gentlemen, please share this video. I've got Sandra Glenn here, a community advocate and enabler, who has created her own training to help local people, um, and also an advocate of um, issues affecting within the, the Black community. Sandra, I don't say minority. I say black and ethnic community. Uh, I don't like to say ethnic. I, I don't say minority anymore. We're a majority. <laughs> you know, I, I, I tend to keep, ladies and gentlemen, on focus. And every Thursday, I want to dedicate this session to the issue of knife crime, gun crime, and development, but not using the word knife crime, gun crime, but keeping that focus because it is something that is happening. I understand that there was a, a killing somewhere, a shooting somewhere in Coldfield in Birmingham, um, my good friend, um, Rachel O'Keller mentioned. So tonight I want Sandra to explain that it is not just London as we keep seeing all the while, but also in Luton. Sandra, talk to me. <laughs> Pronounce Saundra, so I just change it to Saundra for the benefit of those that are on from Bedfordshire. And thank you guys for joining us. We are in desperate times. Our young people, not only in London, but in Luton with the overspill, are taking their lives and not valuing their lives highly enough. And how do we, I, I'm frustrated as a woman who's from Luton, born and bred, how do I contribute towards the change of making a child, a young man, because he's a child, he's 18 or, or less, some of them, how do we stop them from just deciding to take a life for something that's quite petty. Some of it, sometimes it's weak. Well, the one in the mall, the two mall um, stabbings where one person lost their life in, in uh, March, that was over a girl allegedly. And then we've had other ones where it's over drugs or, or, or gang um, retaliation and all that type of stuff. And it's, it's horrific to see young people decide to take up a machete, the, the size of the knives and the weapons and those, those razors, the, the one which is like a razor shirt, it's horrific. We are living in unprecedented times. And because Lon Luton had the overspill from Brent Council, 
of the dis disenfranchised family and they moved them out from the council board of Brent or, and other councils and our council took them in Luton. We've got London children from Stonebridge who were maybe 10, 9 when they moved here, young men with older brothers or, or in some cases older sisters, older siblings, and they placed them into different neighbourhoods. So while they were friends in the beginning, they became uh, sworn enemies on different patches. And yeah, that, that yes. postcode thing, and then now with the county lines and the drug grooming, we've got a multitude of different <laughs> that are, are not just one fix. I call it, it cannot be a bad day, a sticking plaster fix, where you put one plaster on it for a short-term fix and it works for everything. It's got to be a lot of different solutions, short-term, long-term, or medium-term, and then long-term. And I said, in my case, I believe that some of the work on the ground is going to impact the younger ones now, but it may not hurt, help as much with the older ones because some of them, going to be too hard to reach. We have some hardcore youth in Luton who are um, making their parents and mothers' lives a misery. I, I know of a mother living in fear of her son, who's only 18. And yeah, I think that it, it, we don't have transformation centres. I spoke to Lee Jasper and even to Lee Roy Logan to ask if in London, if we have one centre where we can actually sit our youth down and talk to them ourselves and get people with specialists in to talk to them and, leave, and ask them to stay voluntarily while they go through a life transformation if they want to break away from gangs. I was shocked we don't own anything. We don't actually own a building after all this talk and all this dialogue. We don't own anywhere to send our own youth. We don't. And that's one of the biggest problems. So, so okay. So, so what you're saying now is, is this, and, and ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the, the late one with Silburn and um, those on Instagram, like Majesty Raw, and uh, all of you guys, welcome, welcome, and thank you so much. Um, I'm having a discussion with Sandra Glenn uh, about knife crime. Um, Sandra, you mentioned that London and uh, Luton is a, is, a, is a spilling over into yeah. Luton. Mm -hmm. Bre break that down as to the dynamics of London and our Luton got caught in the picture there because you're saying if London wasn't there, Luton would be cool. Well, I'm not, I'm not saying that. We don't know for sure because we're not mm. living with reality. We're living with the fact that London is only 30 miles from Luton. A 30 mile drive is a 30 minute or less train ride. It's accessible, yeah. it's quite near too. And the, the council's having to save money because London, the property price has been so high, have moved over the last decade. Families, they call it the Troubles Family Program, into Luton, and they've, re they've, they've put, put them into neighbourhoods where, we, on one occasion, the death of, of a young man called Delaney Brown was by his former school friend. It, they were formerly in Brent Ward, living together in harmony, and then they were put into Luton into different areas, one in Marsh Farm, one in Lucy Farm, different wards, and they ended up being enemies. And, it, and it's sad to say a 19-year-old is dead because of that dynamic. Yeah. Wow, wow, wow. So 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 they go over to Luton now and, and also there's an issue whereby they join when when someone is feel like you're getting them away, they actually haven't gotten away from their peers or those who maybe they're running away from, if anything. No, it's not it's not far enough. They can still reach out to Stone but a lot of Stonebridge stuff is happening in Luton all the time. And um, we had it last night at this community meeting, which I'll go into in a bit more detail. Yes, people are coming together. There's a community sense of responsibility and the statutory organisations called a meeting. But at that meeting, this is a little a precursor, there was a young man, a gentleman in his 30s, I shouldn't say young, but definitely younger than me. And um, he let us know that uh, as a former drug dealer, that it's very easy to carry things from London to Bedford even. I mean, it's just very accessible and no one's stopping you. He said his plate was on a system, he's on license, he's coming between London and Bedford all the time. And if it wasn't back that he's on the straight and narrow, he could have been in all kinds of runnings right now. Yeah. Talk about county lines. He goes, I could have had kids selling across the county lines. He let us know in the hardest possible sense of the word how much could go on because people aren't seeing it, yeah. Mm, mm. And so, so, 
one of the things that you just mentioned a while ago, you mentioned about like one of the solution is resources. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned Lee Jasper, you mentioned um, the, the sort of resources that is needed. And you mentioned there's not even a building owned. No. Well, let's be honest, uh, we look to London for some of that leadership in terms of advancing the, advancing the issue. Because there's been a lot of talking, discussion. I went to that Youth Violence Commission last week in London at the City Hall. My colleagues, um, the councillor Jackie Burnett, um, uh, she's with Lota Bio Council on the Labour Party, and you've got Lorna Markland, she's um, but they run a charity for 20 years called the African and Caribbean Community Development Forum. They took themselves to the, the Serious Youth Violence Summit, and they met a lot of people there, made lots of information sharing. And what they heard there was the same as what you would hear, what we heard last night. It mirrors it, it parallels it. We have similar problems. But there's not a lot of solutions focused information out there for communities. It's as if we have to somehow come up with the solutions and put them out there. Apart from more stuff. But, 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 yeah, from the yeah. police. But, 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 but Sandra, Sandra you, 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 this is not like something which is new. Mm. Um, and, 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 and I've recognized, and you have also even so told me that there's more than the 25 organizations that I've found. I've, I've got a list of 25 organizations, which uh, I've spoken to a couple so far. Um, Paul Lawrence from 100 Black Men. Um, I'm going to speak to uh, this peace treaty, Israel. I have um, Manhood Academy, which is listed to come on uh, at certain times. And they have been doing things for years. And is it that the solution is not there, or the solution is there, but is the implementation of these solutions? Well, the solution- We're always talking about the solution. Yeah, sorry, please. The, the, the solutions are multifaceted. Uh, last night, people wanted to get going with the youth independent advisory group to the police. You know, to get you to get going with uh, some other broken down groups, smaller groups, to start looking at what can be done on the ground. So they've called for a second meeting in a month's time to start pulling some of those threads of conversation together. You couldn't do it in one conversation with over 200 yeah. community members present. Those people were obviously looking to get the first thrust of what's out there. The police came up with some of the things they've been doing on the ground. They spent a lot more time going to schools and the police have got a school's toolkit in Luton that they give out and they're working with the schools to make sure that young people have information about knife crime and knife responsibility. Mm. They did tell us that they're at their knife amnesty where they put a knife drop box at different key places in, in the towns yes. across the has yielded 2,000 knives. That's a large number. 2,000 knives were handed in. So there are plenty of kitchens across Bedfordshire with the knives missing right now. And that's, it was horrific to hear that 2,000 were handed in in a subscribed period, maybe a month, two months, or something like that. Um, but out of the number of stop and searches they had, something like 1,329 or so. 96, 30, yeah, 1,296, yes. Yeah, yeah. Only, only a few of those had yielded any, any weapons. So it, it shows that the, the average person out there is that they, fit, they think fits a profile of who they're gonna stop and search isn't actually carrying a weapon. And that's a lot of waste of police time and resources, but they have to go through that to find out exactly what's going on on the street, you know? So, so, there, so therefore the success rate in regards to stop and search, which is a controversial um, topic, seems not to be very effective unless it is done properly. And then we, are, we now have the matrix, which is something which is deemed to be very unfair. It's being, the matrix has been called racist. It's a way of racially profiling. It isn't fair to our communities to go to hear that they've been put up against this gang matrix. They said they're not using anything like that down here in Bedfordshire. Um, and we have to hope that's the case, you know. But the Met Police gang matrix, may, for, for those that don't know of it, please do look it up and get to grips with what's happening. Because in real time, that what happens in London, we say, we say when London sneezes, Luton catches a cold. So unfortunately, we do have to live with the reality that what happens in London sometimes becomes our reality a short while longer.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for, for joining. Uh, please share this video. Um, it's important um, if you've got any family members, mothers or whatever like that, young men or so, please share this video and you can also watch it back on replay. Uh, uh, Sandra, the outcome from the meeting last night, and, and, and I want to explain this meeting. Um, this was the Bedfordshire Police Top and Search scrutiny panel. It talks about the outcome from the meeting will be follow-up meeting with action points. One action point, the police will, will set up a youth independent advisory group. Key is it needed to be youth led and independent. There'll be additional counsel, police actions. Um, you got Dwayne Brooks who has been championing the cause regarding knife crime. I've been to forums sometime where these sort of outcomes seems like the same outcomes that keep coming up. But it seems like something is not clicking for it to move into the solution. Well, what is, is there that there's a... Sorry, I Sorry to... yeah. Yeah, we, it almost feels like you're, you're chasing your tail because somebody gets yeah. in or stabbed or someone dies. Then you have meetings. Then you look at the solutions around the meeting. And then there's like a, a short period of quietness and things have got back to a sense of normality. And then it starts all over again. And mm. it, we had that when we had, remember about four years ago when Newton became notorious for having 10 shootings in April of one year. I think it was like 20. Yeah. 2013 or 14. And so we had all the, the national spotlight on us for being a horror a horror city. And um, a lot of people came down here. We had police walking around with guns and it was horrific. But we got through that and, and those shootings did stop. But flooding the streets with stop and search hasn't shown to yield any real benefit apart from people feeling oppressed. And I wouldn't want our young people to feel more oppressed than they already do. So I'm going to ask this question now, and this is a question that everybody will ask is, what are the key solutions or the key answers towards the solution? Five or so, Carol, Sandra, um, what would you say are the, the key five solutions, if anything, Sandra? I'm laughing because you keep calling me by my, my, sis, my sibling is called Carol. I should let people know. He <laughs> uses me with my older sister. And so it's a compliment <laughs> to hear this later that, yes, he keeps calling me cow, but I am so <laughs> <laughs> Um Solutions, um, I don't have the, the answer to everything, but I would ask people to, to consider joining community groups, looking at parenting, looking at supporting um, our parents and our younger people who are raising children, looking at seeking out those that are suffering in silence at home. We've got mothers that we need to support who need help and don't know where to go for it. We need to establish a way of reaching young people in groups in a more informal manner. I said if, if I had money, um, I would make a go-karting centre because I would put people in, in ordinary clothes to go in there, men in, men in particular, to have more male role models. I would ask for people to volunteer some time after work to go down and to coach young people, to spend time talking to the ones that don't have fathers at home, to see if you can coach them and coax them away from the streets and street enterprise. When you hear that um, somebody of 16 is making 100 pounds a day, we've got to find a way to convince them to make 100 pounds a day in a more meaningful manner. And they can do that successfully in a few years time with a little bit of education. And if they can sell on the streets, as I had one post the other day, the person that's leading the selling in these young groups, and there's, there's probably a young person of 20 or their by age group, they would make fantastic management potential if only they knew. But they haven't had maybe the role model in their family to stay in school, or they started speaking to people that they thought understood them better because when they got home, unfortunately, with life and the pressures of today, people are not communicating as much at home. So a young person walks to the door. If you're not taking enough interest in your young person to ask them how their day went, what they're troubled by, take a look to see how they look when they come through that door. You cannot be surprised when they start turning to their friends for that comfort. Their friends become the comfort they're seeking and they spend more time on the streets in that peer group, feeling like somebody and feeling needed and wanted. You've got to make sure you stay connected with your child 
right through to adulthood, no matter what adulthood means. It could be 35, it could be 40. Like my mum said, you're, you're always my child until the day you die, yeah? So you've got to keep your child close, as close as possible in terms of understanding what's wrong with them without invading their privacy, you know? What, what, okay, you, you, I'm going to interject right there. Uh, someone said young people can be very secretive. And then at the same time, uh, you had said earlier that you know of a mother now who is in fear of her child, mm -hmm. her, her son. I, I presume I presume it's a son, not sort of saying only men only or boys only. But it seems like there's a key deficit in regards to parenting, mm -hmm. which is seem to be one of the strong, solid foundation which is somewhat lacking, Sandra. I must say and that you, you touched yeah. Yeah. I don't have Sorry. any children of my own. So I'm speaking from outside looking in, but I have raised a child. I've, I've spent every day with the child, looking after her, taking care of her, making sure that her needs were met. So when it comes to saying you're not a parent, I have done the parenting role, yeah? But um, yes. and it's terribly, terribly difficult. You, you just never know what's gonna happen in life. I mean, you think you're giving a child a, a good upbringing and suddenly you became you become the person who's the worst person in the world and I know parents that tell me that, that this particular mother she was close to her child when he was 13 14 something snapped at 15 he stopped going to school every day she couldn't get him to stay in school he was running off all over the place by 16 he was unbeknown to her selling making it back he doesn't look smart he doesn't look he doesn't look like anybody that's making anything of himself, but unfortunately he was selling and yeah, and then he gets deeper into the selling and he gets deeper entrenched because they won't let you go. The people that get you caught up in that type of life don't want to let your child go. So your child becomes literally their child and they start to feel like they own that child and they've got the right to dictate, but come here this time of the day, be here at this spot. I want to know what you've been doing with my money, brother. And you're literally working for somebody. You're working for somebody who can dictate your every move and tell you what time you're going to go home and eat or spend time with your parents even. And then your child don't want to speak to you when, you, when, you, when they come in because they don't want you to do their business and they become more aggressive and hostile. And it's like, uh, yeah, it, it, it breaks down the whole family structure. Then your other younger children are seeing this attitude. And then so your, your next child down, because for her... The next child down is now 16. Starts with the attitude. Starts with the the, the, the the bad mouthing and talking back. Starts being disrespectful because they've seen the older sibling doing this to the parent. And yeah, yeah it's, it's hard. It's heartbreaking to hear it. It's heartbreaking to watch a mother cry because she can't. She loves her son, but she can't take any more. Yeah. And I've been there yeah. several times with that yeah. kind of scenario. Yeah. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the topic tonight, uh, just a question asked on Instagram land, is knife and, knife and gun crime an epidemic? Is not only in London, but also in Luton. I've got Sandra Glenn. Uh, those on Instagram, I'm sorry you, you're not able to see the split screen, but you can hear and you can go onto my Facebook page, which is Silburn TV or, or Silburn, and you can actually watch it. Uh, Sandra, uh, Bianca mentioned a while ago that uh, young people can be very secretive, which I mentioned earlier. And I think I see one of the reasons why they can be secretive because the peer pressure is sometimes more powerful than the parents. And then that peer pressure give that level of split loyalties, isn't it? As you just echoed a while ago, whereby the split loyalty now, whereby they are now loyal to two forces, the, the gang and also the family. And they've got to make a decision like to who do they give more loyalty to? How is that broken? But how did that start in the, in the first place? Nine months of pregnancy, child comes out, going through the process, is it a lack of the father figure? Well, father figures help, but they're not all, um, not all fathers are good fathers, as you know. Um, for me, you know, but the, the government came up with a prevent strategy, and that was a strategy where they asked people in the community uh, to understand when someone's going through change. When someone around you mm. is becoming a bit different from what they were before, when their behaviour changes, 
when their persona changes, when they start doing things which you wouldn't normally expect them to do. That's the thing, that's a, that's a matrix that the, the government use to, to, to spot in your family or in your community someone that's being groomed to be an, an ISIS member, to go and fight the ISIS, fight for ISIS. Whereas that we don't have that for young people who are becoming gang members. I think they need to take a similar approach, not prevent because it didn't work that well. People didn't like the stigmatization, but they need to encourage parents to notice when their child is changing and to confess that there's a change happening in that child that they've seen every day to a certain point until they change. If they started with that, and right now at the meeting, it came out that you're looking at 12 and 13 year olds. It's a lot younger. 12 and 13 year olds are out there already being groomed to be the next sellers. That is horrific. It's horrific. Yeah. But, but, but 10, year, 10 years ago, 10 years ago, um, there was this gentleman who actually tried to save this young girl's life. And uh, when they were trying to rape her, and you may have seen the news today whereby he was murdered 10 years on. Um, this was Abraham Badu, 26, murdered earlier this year outside his mother's home in East London. 10 years ago, he tried to save a young girl's life. I think he was about 40. And uh, murdered 10 years on because of the fact that maybe there wasn't enough support for him in that process, you know? So it's like, it, it's, it's an everlasting um, epidemic. So, I said that and, and people a very, very sad yeah. and tragic story of somebody that was saving up to move on to a better life. But the young lady who was who was a rape victim, she got all the support to change her name and her identity and to be moved away. Why the local police did not see that he was at risk after his his car was attacked, I read, and he'd had a couple of warnings of, of things happening to his car and to people, things around him, his property. Why would not see that as major warning signs? I don't know. Because that would say that you, the police can put something in place called target hardening, where they protect your home first to see if what's happening to you, can they keep you safe, keep maybe an officer nearby, or they keep a watch out. Or if, if, if all, to me, they should have moved him and given him another identity after the, mm. after the threats he got from those guys. They should have moved him and treated him the same as the rape victim because they asked him to be the key witness which put nine people away or something it's a big number when you have that number and and you're getting text message threats saying you're dead don't you think that they should have had more support for him that poor man i felt really sorry reading that yeah you know you know a, a few years ago um you know based on politics there was a some strange phone calls I was getting, you know, <laughs> and uh, and I remember the police asked me, <laughs> they asked me this question, "Do you want to move?" <laughs> and uh, it was very interesting. It stopped in here, but sometimes politics and uh, make people do strange things, you know. But uh, it was interesting when they asked that question. There, you want to move, and uh, and I believe it's unfortunate for that gentleman that he wasn't moved and he wasn't protected, and um, for the UK to what it is. And, and that is unfortunate. But I want to bring in something else in the whole dynamics of this whole thing. In the 60s, 70s, 80s, we never used to have this as much as possible. What we used to have, I understand, I came in 92, was that there were more prominence in black people in leadership in this country, in business, where it was prominent and you could see it out there. I put it to you, and based on what I'm seeing, that is not the case now. Do you think there's a correlation of the, 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 the deemed regression of the, the black community in the level of economic and political clout that has somewhat has this effect as well based on the strength of the community? Well, Silver, that's a good point. Um, that's a good point. I the, the the introspection and yeah, looking back to move forward. I think that as a child who was born in Luton in Selborne Road, in fact, in the late fifties, I believe that our parents tried to give us a life that they they hadn't yet had. 
and so they did everything they could to make us as comfortable as possible and provide for us as much as they could and to give us opportunities to go to college like my father helped us get our first car he insured it and so on they tried to give what they hadn't that they didn't have and basically i think that while my father's generation would meet as elders and talk about the problems as a group of elder men they were the elder men not being elder by age they just called them the elders they were in their late 30s and 40s i guess at that point in their lives um they were yes. called the elders. so in luton we did have this west indian association of, uh, of elders and they took care of all the local community problems for the black people so if you had a problem you'd call them up and they would come round to the house and they'd be very secretive and they'd be having a meeting and you knew the elders were talking and as children you certainly would be going in to interrupt them because they would you knew your place children unfortunately yes. no longer know their place if i as a, as a as a child did something in the street I, my, my mom would know before i got home whereas nowadays if you try to tell someone that their child's done something, you're more likely to get a mouthful as an, as an, as an, adult, as an adult. They're not going to put up with you talking to their child anymore. The child's not going to put up with it. The child will give you a mouthful. So there's no accountability. You can't actually help people to parent and to raise their child, whereas we had that village feeling before. And the village wasn't just African Caribbeans or Caribbean in, and Jamaicans or whatever in Luton. It was everybody. We knew that Mrs. Smith would tell our mother if she saw us acting out in the street. We knew that there was somebody twitching the curtain across the road, always looking out. And that woman, she saw everything. So you, you, you didn't yes. want her being your mom to tell her, look, I, I think I saw your, your Sandra doing so-and-so. Yeah, before you get indoors, you, they've heard about it. And your parents said, right. don't, don't forget our parents had the right to give us a, a smack or give us a beating. I've got most of you, I wasn't raised with the beatings, but I've heard yes. of my, my peers in Luton, one or two of them were knocked out with a dodge pot. Yeah. <laughs> so so that the parents could use some harsh punishment back then. So you knew that you were up for something if you, if you made problems, let alone try to be on the street selling drugs and not home doing your homework. You couldn't have been doing those when I was growing up. You just, if someone would have noticed that you were doing something that was out of order and you couldn't have got away with it. We didn't have mobile phones, you remember? It was a good old landline. It was a hotline to the business of the local community. <laughs> yeah, so there was right, a lot. Right. Also, I've got to be honest with you, we had the fear of God. Most children yeah. would go to church on Sunday with the family. So it was a family experience. It was still the nuclear family of the parents and the children eating dinner together at night. Doing, so your parent would be more than likely more able to tell that something was happening to you because I know that when um, in our family, when one of my sisters wasn't quite the same as they thought she should be, uh, the parents got onto it straight away. Yeah, more people got involved. The church even got involved. And yeah, it was a lot deeper than it is now. You felt a sense of shame as a child that back then if you acted out. Yeah. You felt a sense of shame if you weren't obedient. I remember feeling the the wrath of God if I even thought about doing something that was untowards. You don't have that now. People don't have a fear of anything and the kids think they run everything and they think that you can't tell them anything and that's where we're at. We're at this constant cycle of kids thinking they can tell the authority, tell the elders and be disrespectful. Um, the other day I, I saw a mixed race youth about 16 years old. He was mixed heritage. He was Nigerian and white and he said Thank you, Auntie. When I we went through the door, I something they were just coming for a door or something. I didn't know him, and I stopped him and said to him, "You're African mix, aren't you?" And he said, "Yes. How do you know, Auntie?" I said, "Because you're saying Auntie, and it's such a small thing." And I thought to myself, "It's terrible, kids. Nobody would call me Auntie now as a sense of as an yeah. respect, but this kid has been brought up by an African father." and he's been taught to use that term for elder woman. And I thought it's nice to be acknowledged as an elder woman and given a bit of respect, yeah? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so therefore, I, I think what we're looking at as, I, I believe one of the key solutions really is the village being mm -hmm. a part of the whole process, right. the community, 
-hmm. and and I, I think one of the ways how that can be done is whereby parents somewhat give over that responsibility as well to their neighbors. So you, you mentioned about the twitching of the curtain whereby the neighbors are actually looking out for each other. But now nobody actually gets to know their neighbors, you know? And 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 as a person who is the chair of a neighborhood watch, uh, we tend to have an idea of the persons who are living in the neighborhood as much as possible. Still, we are trying to make it even stronger, whereby kids or whatever like that can get to know each other, whereby parents can actually see a child on the bus or whatever and know that they have the right. Because remember, I grew up in Jamaica, in Otrius. I know that I'm walking down the road and if I misbehave, somebody's gonna, can reprimand me, you know? And because the, the neighbors and the family and the parents give each other that right. But now everything is a bit, everything is a bit selfish. With the advent of mobile phones and all these technology, should have made it even much more easier so we can keep an eye on each other. But instead, it has made us a bit very insular, insulated and very selfish. Well, and, yeah. and, and I believe that is one of the key problems. Yes, but literally. Do you remember when um, Tony Blair was the, was the prime minister and he kept saying, going back yes. to basics? Do you know what? We never got back to basics because if we'd really done what it said, then we would have, they wouldn't have taken away parents' rights to, to chastise their own child. And unfortunately, having gone so far from that, how to claw it back to the days where you had the right to actually take care of your own child and, and people intervene around you and, and tell your child to stop vandalizing property or to stop doing whatever they're doing. It's going to take some doing. It's going to take a lot. And I actually think that it's local councils have to work to empower the community and to fund some of the programs because it's cheaper than funding the prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Somebody mentioned yeah. at a meeting last night about the cost of prisons and imprisonment mm -hmm. and keeping young people in long term incarceration. And I really think that there's something there about the cost of keeping somebody out and making them into a useful citizen versus the cost of, of locking them up. Yeah. Why do they prefer to lock them up with that cost? They don't give that money out to help seed and fund the projects and the ideas in the community. Right, right, right. So what you're saying is, therefore, it is much easier to lock them up and just to throw the money there than actually utilize that money out in the community somewhat to help to build uh, as, as much as possible. You know? Right. Um, but, you know, just, lis just, just listening now, one would leave and say, Hang on a second, it's doom and gloom. But at the same time, statistics is showing that there's much more children who are doing good as well. But of course, the focus is not there. <laughs> no, we are the excelling in school. Yeah, oh no, the, our, we have a lot of talented, vibrant, and wonderful young people in, in Great Britain today. And, and we have a great many of those talented young people in the black community. And they're getting on. You don't hear about the ones that are doing well and being good, as you said. You hear about the ones that are killing, killing people, going on the mopeds and robbing, doing all the things that are unsavory. And the media loves to highlight. Some of it has to come down on the media, but they are actually not helping either. They love to highlight black people uh, uh, doing things that make looting and make, and make England look bad. Um, and it makes it a negative then because people then think that, oh, why don't they just go back to their own country and that kind of negative stuff coming out of Brexit because they think that, yeah, we're here making life miserable for them. It's not the truth. There's far more white crime and white stabbings and killings than there is black, but you, you don't hear about them. Yeah. Right, you know, right, right. There's another show, if you go to the College of Policing and look at the numbers, um, they had some stats. As you look at their Twitter account, you can see their Twitter account in the open. Um, it's like twitter.com, college slash college of policing. If you look and see those mm -hmm. they put out recently, you'll see that it's disproportionate that we get over, over too much media, overly negative media about smaller number of crimes and criminals. That you think that Britain is full of black criminals is not true. Mm. 
Uh, so that is the does more stop and search mean less crime analysis of Metropolitan Police Service panel data. That's what you're talking about, yes? That that, pad, that, yeah. that data and the data about um, who, the, the ethnic breakdown of who's committing the crime. I, I wish I'd sent you the slide beforehand now, but um, I'll send it afterwards. You can share it. Yeah. Well, well, I'll, I'll, I'll post it. I'll post this one right now into into the thread. Um, what were some of the the outcome, if anything, or or, or so called solution of of last night at this this forum? Well, we had a we had a just for those who who are just joining, we had a knife and search community discussion in Luton last night, attended by two over two hundred concerned members of the public, and it was hosted by Bedfordshire Police and Luton Borough Council in partnership. And they sent the Assistant Chief Constable, Jackie Sabaya, to, to lead, along with the leader of the council, Councillor Hazel Simmons. And then we also had some other people on the panel. It was chaired by a local faith leader, Pastor Lloyd Denny, who's also Jamaican. And he actually happened to be a Deputy Lord Lieutenant. So he's very well respected in the local community. And he managed the flow of the two and a half hours. And two and a half hours is a long meeting for a community, for a community groups to, to attend. It's, it's longer than normal, but I've got most of you, the time went really, really quickly. They had presentations from the representatives on the panel. It was the Stop and Search Scrutiny Chair, who happens to be an African Caribbean male, Montel um, Nuffville. Then you had representation from the policewoman in charge of Operation Sector, which is a national operation about knife crime in the UK. So look up in your areas about Operation Sector and you'll see the work that's going on on the ground by the police to tackle knife and, and gun crime. And then you had representations from the council about what they've been doing. They've got a safeguard. Yeah. They've got a safeguarding um, task force. The police shared the yes. work they're doing in the schools with this toolkit, the work they're doing on the ground to collect knives and get the knife amnesty, and then that they've identified key people who are the perpetrators uh, and, the, and maybe yes. the dealers and the dealers. They're going around at the moment doing the work of getting enough evidence to prosecute a lot of different people. And all of that takes time. But I see that from living here and going through it, that when they get one set, another set pops up quite quickly. Yeah. So you think you've got you've locked away one set of drug dealers, for example, but another set will, will be in the wings waiting to be the leaders and to take over that patch. So you're never going to get rid of the problem in its entirety. It's, it's always going to be there. You've got to find a way of breaking it down and moving it out perhaps. But unfortunately, there's another set always waiting in the wings to take over. So therefore, they, so therefore it's, it's, a, it's a parallel part of action. While that one is happening, you've got to work also the preventative and the, and the, um, the, the proactive in sort of stopping the actual crimes yes, at the same time. but we need to work as a collective. I want to support along with my peers and all the organisations out there, not on that list of 25, because I think, as I said to you, it'd be great if you or others could identify on that list those that might want to work outside of London, because it felt a little bit as though the list was only focused on what you had going on in London. And it was focused yes. because it's a, it was about the Met area and the problems under the Met Police. But please, um, people in London, recognise that we need help too and add to that list and actually identify maybe by breaking it out into a chart those organisations willing to support outside of London. That would be wonderful. So, so, yeah. so, so therefore, it would, be good, it would be good if someone who is listening, who is very keen, can actually do some mapping, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Mapping, of course, of some of the organisations um, from the different aspects or hotspots, Birmingham, you know, Liverpool, Manchester, whatever. I mean, uh, you'll think that nothing is happening anywhere else, but it'd be good to see that mapping and a cross-referencing, isn't it, Sandra? It'd be good. It'd be, it'd be good. I don't know whether we can make it exclusively about the young black, the, the, the black community is not just all young. It's any, let's take it from any age from, uh, let's say the 11 right through to unlimited because the other day you had an incident in London where the man who, who seemed to be the suspect for the crime was an older black male 
um, in his 40s. So let's not limit the number, but have that have some way of identifying just how big the problem is we're looking at as a collective community and how we can get a grip to making delivery agents to solve it in the different communities because it needs to have lots of different projects. Some are going to be driven by statutory organisations, but many are going to come from the community itself. Right, so, so the community has got to just be simply very proactive at the same time. You know, Listen, I, I, you know, the, the more we talk, the more we talk about this, and the more we keep looking deep down at the solutions, uh, I keep seeing one of the strong ones is whereby, and I said this the other day in a brief video, a brief talk by saying, now, what can be done now is this: if you're a parent, start to talk to your children; mm. if you're a parent, start to take control of your home; yeah. if you're a parent, start to understand start to listen as much as possible you know it's it's a learning curve because years ago you never had all these things about parenting assessment how to have how to train your children how to be a parent it was a natural thing because guess what the extended family was there with the grandparent and the older sibling but now everybody's actually so caught up in the rat race mm -hmm. nobody has time People throw the children before the internet. Yeah. An interesting comment made last night by somebody present. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not sure if it was in the meeting or as an aside. They said, remember that you always have young people fighting. And um, whether it's an age thing or not, they said, naturally, 16 to 19 year old males are going to fight each other. And be, back in the days, it was your fist. They would, they would have lots of fist fights in the streets and they would just kick each other and scuffle but they were still fighting even across the turf about issues about you live here and you've come over to ours they were doing it from from many many years ago decades ago but now it's gone from being uh, fist fights to being physical weapons and if your knife is missing from a drawer and you don't know it's missing and it's a big bread knife I think you literally have to take some responsibility for not noticing your stuff's missing. People need to take a lot of notice. If you're sending your child over to visit grandma and she's older, she's up in her 80s and 90s and might not notice, someone's got to do a quick recce and remove the knives so that nobody can get access to them in case there's a temptation to take a knife from grandma's drawer, you know? We've got to protect our kids from themselves. Our local police, uh, Bedfordshire Force, have said that they've gone round to the different shops, particularly Poundland. Ask your Poundland, how are they selling knives? Because the knives are only one pound. Have they put them out mm. of reach? Are they ensuring that all the staff are only selling to age 18 and older? If a, child can, if a person can buy a knife at 18, that's still too young to me. But unfortunately, that's the age you can buy a knife. Um, no, that, 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 is, that is very interesting. I mean, the other day I end up was trying to get some um, some acid mm -hmm. and I found the question was asked, uh, are you over, are you an adult? <laughs> you know, but she, she was just being jokey. She was giving a joke. Well, maybe I looked like a teenager anyhow still. Well, you know, maybe. <laughs> but but that was good. It, it, it shocked me and I, said, I realized, oh, yes, yes, yes. Now I understand why they are doing that because of the rise of these. Can I just answer a thread before it goes? Um, Bianca Grant, I think it is. Bianca, you've seen that if you look in your kitchen, you've lost the battle. I didn't say lock the kitchen. I'm just saying notice where the knives are in grandma's kitchen if she's not able to keep keep track herself. Because you sometimes think, oh, I've lost, I've lost a knife, or I've lost this, or I don't know where that's gone to. And if it's gone out of the house and up the street and it's stuck in a bush waiting for someone to use it, it's not good. Look at that Croydon walk the other day. As a community, they had a prayer. I totally applauded that. The faith organisations had a, a multi-faith prayer, and then they did a big walk to scar the neighbourhood and look for knives. And look how many they found. They found a couple stuck in the bushes where you wouldn't expect it, where you picked up and used that evening or later. That, to me, is intervention where you're showing that community can make a difference, you know? The police were there, mm. the, the, the voluntary stewards from the council were there, 
and then the ordinary members of the, the churches were there and they were walking hand in hand, checking the bushes, checking the neighborhoods to do the first sweep of, of community united action. I, I'd love that to happen down here, but I don't know whether our faith leaders have totally got a handle on how to get leadership on this issue. Yeah. Right. So therefore, there's a call out then for London to actually lead the way for London and also for other parts of the, the UK as well. Yeah, um, I think so. As much as... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody said, so, oh, get the churches, the churches mm -hmm. that open venues, get the churches yeah. to, to start sharing their venues so that you can use them. The biggest thing last night was the closure and the cuts, the austerity measures are costing our youth. Everybody could talk about remembering how important the youth centres were when they were younger. The youth don't have that. They haven't got any youth centres. They've got community centres now where the staff are going to tell you you can't come in and use it because they're going to close in a moment. They're not prepared because they're, they're, they're underpaid to stay one minute past their prescribed time. And now many youth centres only have one or two members of staff. They're not fully staffed. <coughs> Excuse me. And so um, the youth don't have anywhere to go and there's less activities for them to be part of. So what's going to happen? We need to find a way to fill that void while the government gets the, the, the funds back in place to open back the centres. I don't I do that. They've sold them now. Many of them have been sold off. Yes. And, and, and then we're we are coming on to the, the holidays now, the hot summer, because uh, it seems like things get crazy whenever you got the hot sunshine and the May days. You always have these weekends of killings and whatever like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, well, Sandra. Well, I want to thank you so much. Um, but before you go, if anything, what what are the the last words that you like to say, and how can persons help and support the work that you are doing as much well, as possible? The work that I'm doing is 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 restricted to my local area. But I would say to anybody listening that wants to get involved in helping to solve some of the problems of youth on the ground in your local area, to contact the, the community organisations that are out there. Look for ones that you may feel that you want to support or to contact your council and they'll give you a list. And then get involved by contacting them. Be proactive, go to the next meeting and just sign up to help with the problems. And just There's lots of problems in every community at the moment. People need help to manage their children. There's much that we can do. I offer free unlimited support, and I have done for years. I help people with social enterprise creation, which is one mm -hmm. uh, one route to change. Because in the last year alone, I've created two social enterprises with groups for the groups. With them present, I handhold them to understand what a community interest company or the various frame frameworks might be. They've chosen to be community interest companies because there's several people in one company together. And they're both, both of them are going to be working on youth projects. I mean, one of them, the Door Luton, already had a social network for up to 300 young people, 14 to 16 year old. And they give them um, uh, regular social events together, like a school disco. And they've never had any mm. problem at any of those discos. And now she's going to branch it out. Her, um, this is Sharon Barraclough and her co-director. There's four of them, all fantastic people who are parents first and are giving their time to make things happen. And they're going to have their first ever careers and neat fair for Luton youth. The ones that have been excluded from school, the ones that have been youth offending, the ones that don't have any GCSEs. They're going to give them a, a youth fair where they can see careers yeah apprenticeships, training, and business. And I'm, I'm applauding that. Then we've got other, another one, Right Time to Shine. They had a, the death of a male called Delaney Brown. This, but this company, Right Time to Shine CIC, was started by a going through the grief of, their, of the murder of their 19-year-old. And they have yes. now, four years later, five years later, um, since the tragic loss of Delaney Brown Jr., they have now got a CIC where they're helping the Lucy Farm community and the young groups over there to heal, rebuild, and move on. One of the one of the um, sessions they gave them 
was, even though it's this far down the road, was a group that's called Grief Share. And it looked at the ways in which the communities and people grieve and need to move on to that final acceptance. And they made the point of saying that we need these programs to be available in the first early stages of losing somebody. Has anybody managed to give this sort of training and support to all the losses you've had in London so far? 68 or something. Yes. I mean, what, what happens in communities where if they don't have access to the programs that some of the groups down here have now discovered? We were fortunate that our police and crime commissioner is funding victims, and she, Catherine Holloway, has made it a priority to fund victims of all colours, groups of all colours, and make it as diverse and different as possible. And I have to applaud the Conservative, which is, but she, she, uh, what's important, she has put her money money to groups that we don't normally access any type of funding making and they yes. they deliver successfully and she's helping them again in year two so this is her second year of, of um she's her second year of office and she's actually funded the a young group again to do more work on the ground with their victims so that they don't have to have a sudden halt to that to that support they were getting amazing mm -hmm. makes a big difference okay the yeah. positive a positive uh, impact of police and the police body supporting you with real, yes. with real money you know real real funding yeah. so yeah it's a well well listen listen sandra um i want to thank you so much for for coming on um and what 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 what, I, what i'll be very grateful for and people will be grateful for is if you utilize the same thread and post some of those links or key information in there as well and to keep the conversation going and ladies and gentlemen i'll ask you as well to use this time as well and share this video as much as possible this is just a, a continuance of the process of education sometimes um sanjo we may not even have the answer directly yeah. but i think by keeping the conversation constant and keep talking about it we will somewhat start to get the solution and being a part of the solution and, and recognize that every one of us have a responsibility, not just because we may not have a child, not just because it is not happening to us, because it's always too late when it's happened to us, as we always say, you know? And, and, as, and as that lady who recently lost her son and she was wiping away the blood, she said, let my son be the last if you recall, you know. Before uh, I get still born, can I just quickly say to everybody, I have to truly applaud the people in, in Luton and the communities that came out and the ones that want to work together. Uh, it makes for an unusual coming together and healing and supporting when you see that mass group of people coming out. And I want to thank everybody and I want to thank the police and our council for having listening leadership because that's important too. I think when people come to Luton, and please do come and visit us, you're gonna be surprised that we have listening leadership. If I need to reach the senior chief constable, or the chief constable or his senior officers for a matter that's pressing our community, I can pick up the phone and reach them and they will call me back. That's, people told me that's rare. If I need to reach the police and crime commissioner or a members of the public reach her office, and get hold of Catherine Holloway with a pressing concern, she's going to get back to you. And most people in most communities don't have that. They're out of touch and yeah. they come to them. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, time has run out. Time has run out on us. <laughs> um, Sandra, listen, thanks for that. That was very informative and uh, very powerful. And uh, thank you for the short notice that you came on as well. And, um, and have a wonderful night. Thank you, Sir. <laughs> Appreciate it. Thank you, everybody. Awesome. Good night. Thank you very much, Sandra. Have a good evening. Thank you. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you so much for, for coming on. And as you can see and, and listen to the discussion today, uh, we just have to keep continuing, continuing with the process, continue with the discussion, and keep seeking for the solution. As I said, I've dedicated this Thursday night um, looking at the issues regarding uh, knife crime, gun crime, and violence, and to have this platform for that.
Uh, I mentioned about various organizations which are out there. Uh, Sandra is going to give me also a list of organizations from Luton as well. I'm going to tap into Birmingham as well. And, and uh, because, as I said, there are over 25 that I have. 100 Black Men of London, Amos Bursary, Generating Genius, the Goodwin Lawson Foundation, the Sickle Cell Society, the Steve Lawrence Charitable Trust, um, Urban Synergy. Um, these are organizations, some that I know, some that I don't know of. Um, I've got my researchers actually out there looking at trying to get the right persons to have these discussions with. Ask them to come on as well. Um, as well, I've had Layla Thomas from Urban Synergy on the red chair before, the Reach Society, Manhood Academy, Organ Rites of Passage, MRAP, Road CEO, West Side Young Leaders, South Side Young Leaders, East Side Young Leaders, National Association of Black Supplementary Schools, Black Children, Black Families Education Support, Super U Academy, African Sons and Daughters, the Black Child Agenda, there's more. Ultra Education, the Black African Asian Therapy Network, Fathers to Father, the Gentlemen, I like that one, Access UK, and there are tons more, ladies and gentlemen, tons more. So I want to thank you so much for coming on tonight. Um, and remember to like and share the channel, Silburn TV, Facebook, like the Silburn TV Facebook page, that is crucial like the Silburn TV uh, YouTube channel. Most of the shows goes live up on YouTube and they're not actually edited, just load it up. Um, uh, Silburn TV on Instagram, Silburn TV on um, as well. And just a couple announcements. This Saturday, I'm hoping to have Mark Renaissance Cameron. Mark Renaissance Cameron is in the States. Um, Saturday is my international night whereby I'll have a guest somewhere from the US, Canada, um, Jamaica, or wherever to look at different issues. I've got Magister Raw, um, a, a lady who creates um, these raw juices, hopefully to come on from the States as well at another time, as well, exploring different ways of actual natural ingredients as well as possible, you know? And politics, important for politics. Another night will be business night as well, where we talk about business, as much as possible. Empowerment, all these different key factors, crucial, crucial, and crucial, you know? So without further ado, I want to bid you a wonderful night. Like, share, and remember to let me have your comments as well uh, as possible. And uh, yeah, peace out. Instagram, thank you so much. Peace out and all the best. And let music just play out for a bit while we shut down. And uh, and thank God it's Friday tomorrow, and uh, and it's a weekend. Thank you. Good night, Silburn, and I'm out. <laughs>